Right out of college, I worked two jobs as I was preparing to leave for seminary. One as a server in a restaurant, and the other in the Office of Admissions at JMU. So as we fly through the month of March, and April is right around the corner, it brings back many memories of a stressful season, both in and out of the admissions office. May 1st is the deadline for students to decide where they are headed to college. And as I was the receptionist for the admissions office, I was bombarded at my desk from late March to late April by stressed out students and their families, either those that were deciding between multiple fine institutions or those who were waitlisted at JMU and were desperate to prove why they should move off the waitlist. My heart broke for the countless students who poured out their resumes to me, a receptionist who couldn't affect any change on decisions for admission, and they, they wondered if all that they had done would be enough. These were captains of the color guard, chess club presidents, founders of the school knitting circle, and the star of the musical. There were district band kids and starters on three varsity sports teams. They were devoted community servants, and they could be found in their churches praying faithfully eight times a week if their pastor's stock recommendation letter was to be believed. Student after student poured themselves into extracurriculars with the hopes that their devotion might be enough to overcome that C in algebra and history and English and Spanish and, and chemistry, too. And while it wasn't true of every story I heard, I still see the trend all around us where students are pouring themselves into activities to see what, will, what that will get them down the road. Resume boosters, great personal essay experience. Oh, your college admissions panel will love to see that. It's a lot. I was guilty of the same thing as a student, and so I know where they're coming from. What each of these students and their families want is a good return on investment. While some might have jobs and therefore a little money to their name, for most youth what they have is time, their most precious commodity. And these students were so desperate in the admissions office because they had invested so much of their time in all of these different places. And now it was time to see if they had any return. What would they be getting out of all they had put in. I don't think this trend ends with college. We all have resources to invest. Time remains a big one throughout our entire lives. But mental energy, physical energy, emotional energy all require an investment. And most come with the hope that there is some return. I spend all that physical energy at the gym, I better see some big muscles. I pour all my emotional energy into this friendship. You better be there for me when my life is falling apart. And this isn't even scratching the surface of the ways in which we use and invest our financial resources, our skills, and our property in the things that we say matter to us while hoping in the end that we have something to show for our risks. So much of our world today seems to suggest that all things require of us an investment of some kind, and the only question that remains is what do I get out of it at the end? Strangely, it seems that our parable of the talents in today's gospel plays right into that same what's in it for me or return on investment mindset, where on the surface, it looks like a little bit like God invests in us only to get something out of us. So in a season of asking why, let's wrestle with this parable together. A master is going on a journey, leaving for some time, and he entrusts his property to his servants. One servant is given five talents, another two, and another one. A talent was a unit of measurement in the ancient world, around 80 to 100 pounds, which would ensure that silver and gold were being measured out appropriately but it was also used as a financial concept, representing about 6,000 denarii, 
with one denarius being a Roman coin that was the average daily wage, 6,000 denarii, or one talent, represented about 20 years worth of wages. Call it about a million bucks today. This was an absurd amount of money that these servants would have been handed, an absurd amount. The first is given 100 years of wages, an unfathomable amount of money for any first century Galilean servant. But even the one who's giving a measly one talent is holding the value of 20 years worth of labor. Immediately we hear that those with the five and the two talents begin trading and dealing and essentially double what their master has given them. That's 200 years of labor and 80 years of labor income, respectively, which they are then delighted to share with their master when their master returns. The master's overjoyed, and they are celebrated. And so the story quickly shifts to the third servant, and by the amount of conversation time that Jesus gives this third servant, I think this one might be the point of the parable. The third servant's been given one talent. Still, 20 years worth of wages is no small sum. And when the master returns, the servant admits that he is terrified of the master. He casts some accusations on the character and ethics of the master, and in fear admits that he did nothing with what he was given. Instead, he buried 20 years of income in the ground until the master returned. The master replies, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So a few things about this. The master's right. A million dollars? Put it in an endowment? Might average about $50,000 a year in today money. If we did that at Muhlenberg, we would have essentially a fully funded staff position every single year in perpetuity. If anybody's got a talent or five laying around, (laughs) let me know. It's no small thing. And it's nowhere near the extraordinary efforts that the other two servants seemed to take to deal and trade and double the property that had been entrusted to them. And so also the third servant makes some assumptions about the master that he reaps where he does not sow, that he gathers where he does not scatter, and he labels the master as harsh. Master never really confirms nor denies this. He simply says, is that what you know? Is that what you think of me? Okay, I'll follow you. Let's forget for a second that I just handed you a million dollars and five million to your other friend over here. I'll run with that. If that's what you think of me, Why not invest it? Parable does not confirm that this is God's nature, but questions why the third servant didn't seem to act according to the things he professed to fear about the master. Because from this parable, we don't know what would have happened if the third servant had traded the talent and lost it. I'm not certain that the master would have responded harshly in that case as it seems that his real disappointment is in the fact that the servant does not care about what's been entrusted to him. Because in the end, this is not a prosperity gospel parable. It's not saying to us that God gives us all the money we have, and therefore, in order to please God, we just need to go make more money. It doesn't really seem to be about the money at all. Each of the servants is entrusted with an incredible amount of responsibility for the incomparable value of that which belongs to their master. In this way, each of us has been entrusted with the incomparably valuable gifts of our master. We who have received grace through the waters, we who have been fed with forgiveness at the table, we who have heard the words of mercy spoken through Christ and through the prophets, we who have received everything that we could call our own from the hands of the one who created it, We have been entrusted with talents beyond measure. The question now remains for us whether or not we have invested, shared 
multiplied and made known the responsibility that is in our hands? Or have we projected some fearsome visage on our God that causes us to bury what we've been given in fear? This is only a parable about money in so much as it is a parable about all things and the responsibility we have for all that we have been given. Our time, our gifts, our money, our grace that we have received through the love of Christ, our hope that we cling to, all that we have is an incomparable gift that we are called not just to hoard for ourselves, but to share with the world because we trust in the God of abundance who multiplies that which is given. This parable concluding with a lesson on the great responsibility that we bear in life reminds me of the beautiful poem, The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. There's a famous line that concludes this poem, which I've seen used on so many different motivational posters, hoping to inspire people to do more and be more and create more. It says, tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I love that. Don't you want to just go invest and do more and be more? But do you know what Mary Oliver's response to that question was? To go wander in a field, to fall down in the grass and watch a grasshopper eat, to observe the trees and the birds and, and find her place of wide wonder in this incredible world around her. Her response wasn't simply to do more, it was simply to be present. What are we to do with this life we've been given and the responsibility that has been entrusted to us? We are called simply to live it outwardly, to trust that the life of love that is all around us is a life worth experiencing and a life worth sharing. Abundance is everywhere. It is the responsibility of every follower of Christ to share what has been entrusted to us. In this deep trust in the abundance of God, we find everlasting life, the way of God's kingdom, breaking in here and now to our world. So to the high schooler out there who is striving, 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 and doing more and more with hopes that it will boost their resume, I would share this parable of hope. Strive not for production, but strive to share the joy of your heart and the gifts you've been given. You are enough to share the gift of you. To any among us, who feel like we must do more, earn more, and thereby earn God's favor. I would hold up this reflection on the meaning not of profit, but of responsibility. A life of sharing and multiplying and trusting is the life we are called to live, not one that is bound in fear in such a way that our hope is buried deep within us. Pastor and Professor Wesley Allen offers this reflection on what he believes to be the ultimate meaning of this parable, saying, the ethical Christian life is not a test for which we are rewarded. The ethical Christian life is the reward. The more we live it, the more of it we get. Why invest, dear church? Why pour our lives, our time, our finances, our property, our grace, our hope, and our gifts into this way of discipleship? Because this way of abundance is the only return we will ever need. This way and the life we share is the gift and the joy of God's heart. God is not just profiting off us. God's grace is the gift that keeps on giving and the investment that is sure and the return that is eternal. We find this truth among one another when we invest in one another, when we invest in community, and when we multiply the gift of grace we find here. We strive to be a wellspring of God's grace, equipping all people to live out Christ's love and trusting in the goodness and mercy of the one who has poured out their life for ours, that we may live abundantly here and now. Amen.